morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure being here. Uh, we all know that fighting corruption is a challenge uh, everywhere around the world and across all sectors. Uh, and of course, well-designed rules, regulation, frameworks are important, but we also know today that it's not enough. And more and more practitioners are looking closer into underlying drivers of corrupt behaviors. So understanding behavior and quite often, these drivers are not only following conscious and rational cost-benefit calculations, uh, as it is often assumed. For instance, um, powerful social norms uh, related to reciprocity can drive gift-giving practices to public uh, officials. Um, also, uh, the idea that everybody is corrupt, what, what you often hear when you're in countries, now uh, corruption is everywhere, can be important because First of all, as human beings, we tend to follow behavior from people around us. Uh, and second, these kind of thoughts allow us to rationalize, to justify own uh, unethical behavior and make us feel less bad. So to be more effective in fighting illicit behaviors, it is important to ac account for behavioral elements. And, and these uh, do not change so easily. Uh, uh, changing laws, for instance, does not by itself change behaviors. Uh, we need more. And at the OECD, we published a report in 2018 uh, on applying behavioral insights to promote integrity policies. And we are increasingly encouraging uh, governments around the world to apply behavioral lens to improve the policies. And of course, this perspective is also relevant for preventing corruption and ensuring integrity in the design and enforcement of environmental regulation and policies. And uh, this is what our panel today will uh, look into in more depth. How can behavioral insights be applied to complement and strengthen efforts of tackling green corruption and, in particular, corruption facilitating illicit wildlife trade? So, with that in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel for the discussion today. So, uh, Gail Burgess is the Behavioral Change Coordinator at Traffic, which is a leading NGO working globally on trade in wild animals and plants in the context of both biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. Uh, Gail leads Traffic's innovative work in the field of social and behavioral change communications, running various projects with relevant stakeholders targeted to specific consumers of a variety of threatened wildlife. Welcome, Gail. Uh, Alex Ngabirano is the founder and director of Bewindi Development Network in Uganda. He leads the Bewindi Reform Poachers Project in the Buhoma Bewindi Impenetrable Forest National Park in Uganda. The project aims to reach traditional hunters so that they engage in other more sustainable income generating activities. Welcome, Alex. And last but not least, Saba Kassa is joining us from the Basel Institute on Government, uh, Governance, which is working around the world to strengthen governance and counter corruption and other financial crimes. Saba is a public governance specialist and a member of Basel Institute's public governance team. And under the Green Corruption Program, she contributes to the Institute's research on understanding the context-specific drivers of wildlife trafficking and the role of informal social networks and their associated corrupt practices. Welcome, Saba. So the session uh, is organized in two rounds. Uh, first, our panelists will share in about five to 10 minutes their experiences in applying behavioral insights from their specific work. And then in the second round, the panelists will discuss in two, three minutes each the opportunities and challenges of applying behavioral insights to fight green corruption. After that, we will open the question for the audience, uh, as mentioned by Johanny, and we encourage you all to write the question uh, to the panelists by using the chat box. We will keep track and identify similar and recurrent questions so we can be able to answer as much question as possible uh, in the time we have. We will be recording the webinar and it will be made public in parts or in entirely uh, later. But now I already talked too much, uh, so let's begin with the first round. Uh, Gail, let, let me start with you. As behavioral change coordinator, you champion traffic's endeavors to reduce the motivations for the consumption of illegal wildlife products. Could you share a bit more about how social and behavioral change communication can reduce consumer demand? Can you give us some examples of tangible success stories? And um, you also have developed the integrity framework could you explain to us how adopting this approach can change corrupt behaviors? 
please. Lovely. Um, thank you very much, Frederick, and uh, yeah, thank you to Basel and OECD for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Hopefully, you can hear me clearly. Um, so yes, uh, as you introduced, uh, social and behaviour change approaches have um, increasingly uh, recently been used to uh, influence consumer demand for um, away from illegal wildlife products. We, we call this demand reduction, uh, perhaps not necessarily in the strict economic uh, definition of that term, but uh, there's a large effort uh, in particular directed at commodities in, in some countries in Asia. I thought I would uh, talk to people today a little bit about some of the work um, focused on elephant ivory consumption in China and also uh, rhino horn consumption in Vietnam. So focusing um, first um, on the work in China, for those that know a little bit about um, social and behaviour change, it includes three strategic approaches. So um, the first is focused on advocacy and uh, that's kind of the legislative and regulatory framework around uh, the issue. Um, the second strategic approach is around social mobilisation. So this looks at social norm um, kind of influencing and uh, public awareness of, of the desired behavioural goals. And then there's a behaviour change communications, which are very much more sort of highly targeted towards key user groups um, and trying to get them to um, switch from the negative behaviour to the more desirable one. So um, focused on, on advocacy first, uh, some, some of the audience may well already know that um, domestic ivory ban was enacted in China on the 31st of December 2017 and this complemented an international ban which had been in place through CITES since 1989. There was a very significant push um, associated with this domestic ivory ban to raise public awareness um, around this shift in um, legislation and, and that was conducted by multiple organisations. Um, so a, a real effort to get people, um, make them aware of, of this major change. This also helped to shift how socially acceptable it was to buy and own ivory. So some examples of some of the public reaching activities that happened, those traveling to Africa in particular, the three main um, mobile service providers in China sent texts automatically. So you know this text that you receive when you land somewhere and it tells you about the local um, tariff for use of your mobile phone. Um, there was an additional text that was distributed by those companies to Chinese travellers to remind them not to buy ivory, rhino horn or other endangered species products and to encourage them to comply with the local laws. Um, there's also been precision marketing and a very significant effort conducted by the 34 members of a global coalition to end wildlife trafficking online and they've collectively uh, removed over 3 million ads for illegal wildlife products on their platform. So this is a very powerful signal from uh, influential forces commercially and otherwise um, that this is no longer um, a behaviour that's acceptable to conduct anymore. So an example of some of the more targeted work that happened thinking about the behaviour change role. Um, traffickers engaged uh, part of the collection community in China. This is a very large community, engages close to a million practitioners. Um, ivory carving, some may also know as a UNESCO listed intangible cultural heritage in China. Um, and uh, Wen Wan Tiangzi, a, a corporate body, is an umbrella group for this community in China. So. Um, we engaged them in a partnership under what's called the Green Collection Initiative, and they worked with fifth generation um, former ivory master carvers to repurpose their skills much more towards alternative materials. So thinking about things like um, fruit pits um, and uh, showcasing both a positive alternative behaviour and a consumption material that people could buy. Um, but also pr proving that the value of the products was more in the skill of the craftsmanship and rather than the material that was used. And uh, in 2019, when we interviewed the CEO of One One Tengzia, he reported that 30 to 40 percent of the workforce have now successfully been redistributed towards use of these sustainable materials. So that, that shows a real groundswell that can happen from, from this targeted sort of in intervention. Um, research was released earlier this week on the 12th of April. Um, WWF have been conducting uh, annual surveys for the past four years, tracking the impact of um, Chinese citizens' attitudes and behaviour towards ivory consumption in China. Um, in research uh, prepared by Globescan for WWF, 2,000 citizens uh, across 15 cities in China 
um, the consumer intention to purchase ivory in the future is now less than half of the pre-ban levels in 2017. So it went from 43% in that first annual survey to 18% in this most recent one. Um, we can share the link on that uh, if people are interested. In Vietnam, moving very rapidly through to some of the work we've been doing with uh, rhino horn consumers, we identified the major use group there as um, a consumer called Mr. L. We sort of came up with this archetype of the consumer, the major user group, who consumes rhino horn for status and to demonstrate his success. Um, very strong effort there on behavior change communications. Um, and we were uh, kind of developing a behavior change campaign under the, the use of the term chi. So chi is a concept um, about strength of character, strength of will. And we were encouraging uh, the Mr. L user group to rely on chi rather than a piece of rhino horn to demonstrate success, strength of character and status. Status. So research there also demonstrates promising progress um, where we have a, a drop in members of the research study that intended to purchase rhino horn in the future, um, declining from 16 to 9% of those surveyed. And we're looking into that more. Obviously, this is just research, um, looking at what people tell us, and it's important to triangulate that with um, high quality insight into what's actually they're doing. So there's uh, additional research looking at that. Um, so all of this type of experience and, and the lessons learned traffic um, engages a community of practice. Um, we've been gathering expertise, uh, not just based on what we've been doing, but what others in the field have also been doing, looking at how behavioral science has um, evidence in other fields. So in particular in the anti-corruption um, field where there is a strong track record um, and thinking about things like public health and development bringing together a simple um, kind of framework through a mnemonic. Integrity is uh, intended to be a mnemonic that non-experts in behavioral science can still use to think about how they might bring some of this success and the, the evidence base to bear in the work that they're already doing. Um, and so integrity, I'm going to read it out um, and send a link in the chat function for those that would like to know more about the framework. But um, I, the first I in integrity stands for insight. So this is fundamental. We'll touch on this in the second round of questions as well. Um, insight into the factors facilitating and driving corruption, really understanding the context and the problem because every circumstance is different. This is the first rule of any intervention uh, to tackle corruption as we know. Um, the N stands for narrow the focus. So it's really important with behavior change communications in particular to be very specific about the behavior you're trying to change and the audience you're trying to do that with. Um, thinking about T, the theoretical foundation, some of your, your audience may already be familiar, there are hundreds of models, theories, frameworks of change that uh, can be used, you don't have to be um, an expert in all of them to identify three or four that can be especially impactful, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit more if the audience are interested. Um, moving to E, thinking about how to engage, encourage and equip people to make changes. Um, the G would be very focused on group actions because um, social norms in particular can be a very powerful force, both for shifting social tolerance around corrupt tax when they occur, but also increasing public confidence about change can happen. One of the things that we've encountered very much in the illegal wildlife trade space is that you don't want to over communicate that it's a social norm, it's already happening because that can really discourage people from feeling confident about their ability to make any difference or a change. Um, the R in integrity is for recognizing and rewarding good practice where you see it. Um, the next I is in re relation to the, what I would call an intervention mix. This is just recognizing that social and behavior change interventions really fit within a much broader picture. Um, they need to complement a, a suite of preventative and persuasive measures that can be brought to bear around the problem. Um, and we can again perhaps talk about that a, a little bit more as we move through. Um, the T is test and trial. It's always good to make sure that before you really uh, try to roll out something at uh, either a regional or a national scale, very important to make sure you've done pre-testing. This is quite standard with any behavior change approach. Um, and then the final Y is yes to sharing the yield. Not sure it communicates in every language, but I did make an effort with that one. Um, so um, yeah, it's uh, intended very much to kind of bring together and distill some of the key lessons learned that are relevant to behavior change work in other fields um, and bring that to bear to help encourage and enable anti-corruption practitioners to figure out how best to design their, their own programs using this framework. So um, 
Uh, thank you very much for the chance to introduce it and uh, look forward to hearing more from others. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gail, for these uh, impressive results and the work you have been doing. Uh, and very interesting, this uh, integrity framework with the, uh, I, I like it very much, especially working on, on public integrity. Uh, it, it fits very well and, and aligns very well with, with other frameworks we know from, uh, that, that are being used. Uh, I have uh, also some questions, but perhaps uh, in the last round, we, we will uh, have the opportunity to come back. So now uh, moving to uh, Saba, uh, the Basel Institute on Governments uh, government recently concluded a large research on behavioral drivers mm -hmm. of the illicit white lifestyle in Uganda. Uh, could you please share some insights on how the social norms and beliefs drive these early stages of trafficking in, in, in the country? And what mm -hmm. is the role of green corruption in sustaining this uh, wildlife trade in Uganda? And how can behavioral insights play a role in reducing this trade? Okay. Thank you very much, Frederick. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and to share some of the insights uh, on the of the research that the Basel Institute on Governance is leading on wildlife trafficking. Uh, one component of this research has been about uh, uh, trying to understand better, more critically, the drivers of wildlife trafficking. And one particular component of that focused, uh, it was about understanding what would be the motivations for someone to engage in particularly the earliest stages of trafficking. And our research focused on Uganda, which is known to be a, a kind of a hub for wildlife trafficking in the East African re uh, region. Uh, the context of this study, we spoke to different, uh, many experts, but also engaged in conversations uh, with, uh, in focus group discussions with former poachers, but also people that live around wildlife habitats. And uh, the research really shows that uh, motivations to engage in the, in the earliest stages of uh, wildlife trafficking is, is predominantly driven by aspirations for wealth, to overcome um, social economic hardships. And one way that came really across in the research was that we had, we developed a kind of a scenario, a hypothetical situation, which we presented to the focus group discussion participants, um, a scenario in which someone offers someone else uh, the opportunity to engage in kind of activities uh, similar to these first stages, supporting in the transport, et cetera. And we asked the focus group participants basically, what do you think this person would respond? Uh, would they accept, accept or decline the offer? And the majority of the, of the people, the participants said that this person would surely accept such an offer. Uh, and, and, and the why behind that was that it was a way to overcome some economic constraints, a way to provide for those around this person, but also importantly, because there would be significant social pressures to accept such a, 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 a deal, let me put it like this, because uh, doing something else would be considered uh, foolishness. So the research shows really that there are these, these structural drivers related to the economy or economic opportunities and more broader the, the governance context of Uganda, weak, weaker governance that provide this kind of macroeconomic condition for all kinds of actually illicit activities to flourish one of which is a wildlife trafficking. So this is a major one of the way or a major explanation of why, what are the drivers and facilitators of wildlife trafficking. But interestingly, it was not the full story. What we also learned in this research was that there are very power to, powerful narratives or frames around wildlife and wildlife trafficking that further compound this. Uh, the first one we, we, we know, took note of in this research was about the wildlife itself was that it was viewed in a very um, utilitarian way. So it was a commodity, something that is state owned and that competes with uh, citizens for, for natural resources, public resources. The other three frames were around wildlife trafficking itself. So the narrative one was that it's kind of, it's an informal trade, not necessarily a crime. It's something that is legitimate, it has legitimacy and third, that it's a source of wealth and status. And what this does is feeds into this kind of broader social acceptability of engaging in these earliest stages of wildlife trafficking. And, and this, this matters because it, if in the context of this scenario, for instance, we asked participants to what they thought of the person uh, that made the offer. And this person wasn't viewed as a criminal or, or something, something else. They were viewed as someone 
was actually uh, a generous person that cared for those around him, that offered opportunities of employment, and that was actually a responsible member of the community. So if we think of the way in which to, 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 to prevent and combat wildlife trafficking, these uh, targeting these structural drivers is very important, uh, related to econ economic incentives, related to the broader governance environment. But it's, it's, you, it's also incredibly important to tackle these adverse uh, stereotypes. And why? Because um, they are not just ideas or perceptions people have. It, it also influences the way they make, people make decisions. So it acts like a kind of a moral justification or a, or a license to engage in, in a behavior that might someone might understand to be illicit or against the law. And this has implications for the way, if we think of the way we can apply behavioral insights uh, to fight green corruption. And to explain it, let me let me switch switch the switch a little bit. If we move it, our com our analysis to the putting the public official now at the focal area. Um, this becomes a bit more clear. If we think of the, the arch type example of how we think uh, or how, how we would explain that corruption facilitates IWT, we might think of a, a border official uh, that receives a bribe and that would look away uh, to let something pass by the border on account and justify or driven by a low salary, so an economic incentive. Our research also eliminates that there are that these frames provide a moral license. So they, this border official can justify this on account that this is not really a very much uh, a serious kind of crime. It's just a form of informal trade. It, another example, if we think of a ranger who've just uh, caught a small scale trafficker, they might be inclined to accept a gift to let such a person go on account that they can relate to this, uh, the economic motivation or the social economic drivers that push this person to engage in trafficking in the first place. So it tells us that green corruption can be morally licensed or justified on account of these frames that are around wildlife trafficking, framing it as not so serious, not really a, a, as a, a big um, serious kind of crime, something that's benign, informal trade and even legitimate. Um, so even in this is, this is reinforced if we think about these frames, they're not just about wildlife trafficking, they're also around corruption. So in Uganda, there are very powerful narratives or frames around corruption. Um, the idea, like you were saying, explaining Frederick, that it's everywhere, that everyone engages with it. It's associated even with identity and uh, national leadership, the way people would justify it. Um, so it's not just about uh, think, um, uh, the, do, uh, increasing the cost, reducing the benefits. We have to also tackle uh, these kind of stereotypes that reinforce it, that, that give people a justification to engage or a license basically. Um, so if we think of ways in which we can challenge that, we have, there are some very good insights from behavioral theory, for instance, about um, showcasing or challenging exactly these these um, these conventional understandings around wildlife trafficking and eliminating the hidden cost. This can be done through information or edutainment campaigns that, that really give examples or stories around that would change the frame. It can also be done through positive um, role models. The idea would be to reframe those narrative and also to make to eliminate the hidden cost. That would then make it less socially acceptable or support that uh, that that process and also make it more um, bridge the gap between what may be now considered legitimate and illegal versus in, in, in the eyes of the law. So these are very, um, yeah, I think powerful ways in which variable insights can be applied to fight green corruption by basically uh, in reducing the social acceptability and improving the social legitimization for uh, why we fight wildlife trafficking and also green corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saba. It's very interesting and, uh, and it shows very well how understanding the motivation and the underlying drivers can inform better, uh, better policies. Uh, I imagine we will pick up again the moral license in part in the discussions. And I just want to highlight one thing before moving on this uh, priming the positive behavior especially as we in the anti-corruption community uh, over the last 30 years have 
in focusing a lot on the corrupt people. And behavioral insights precisely also uh, reminds us that the vast majority of people is not straightforward corrupt. And uh, we have to, um, and it gives us instruments also to, to think about the others and how to make them visible. So now uh, we will show a pre-recorded video uh, from Alex. Uh, he was interviewed by Claudia Baez from the Basel Institute, who is heading the public governance team at the Basel Institute. And in this interview, Alex tells us about the origin of the uh, Reformed Poachers project uh, of the Windy Development Network. He will tell us about the co collaboration with government partners and how to account for behavioral drivers of green corruption and illicit wildlife trade. So looking forward for the video. Hi, Alex. Hello. Would you like to say a few words to introduce yourself? Thank you. I am Alex Ngavirano, born and raised from Buindi local community. I have worked in conservation for the last 15 years, saving mountain gorillas and other wildlife animals by engaging the frontline communities in wildlife conservation. In 2014, I founded the Buindi Development Network after discovering that I was uncontrolled forest access of resources and increased poaching. Thank you, thank you. So we have heard about your work. Could you tell us about the Reform Poachers Program? of the Windy Development Network. How did that come about? How the Windy Reform Poachers came out? Uh, first of all, Windy Development Network was founded on the independence of a human wildlife conflict. This follows mountain gorillas being killed or injured by the local people living around Wind Imperial National Park during Ching, other antelopes, but also gorillas become victims. The intervention of uh, combating human wildlife conflict were designed to this poaching, further, further emphasized to sensitize the frontline communities in order the importance of wildlife conservation. Purposely, to engage the communities in wildlife conservation and targeting to reform the traditional wildlife animal poachers for sustainable livelihood activities. This has uh, worked very well. I'm happy that um, the first sensitization meeting we had, the we managed to get the first 10 who reformed from poaching and handed over their poaching tools voluntarily. And today, we are reaching uh, 250 who, has been, who have been reformed from poaching. This is the impact caused by Build Development Network in collaboration with the first 10 who reformed because they are, the reformed poachers are now uh, wildlife conservation educators in the community. That, that's really interesting, Alex. Um, I, I, I understand that you've had uh, for this program support from Uganda Wildlife Authority. So can you tell us a little bit about um, how that collaboration has come about? In other cases, we, we have heard that the relationship between communities living close to wildlife and the authorities tasked with preventing poaching can be very difficult. So what are the factors that have supported the development of a collaborative relationship between the Uganda Wildlife Authority and your um, organization? Uh, the factors that uh, are collaborative relationship between Ua Buindi Imperial National Park and Buindi Development Network. One is a local partnership. The partnership we have with the Buindi Imperial National Park in particular, especially 
the, the community conservation and the law enforcement department. We work together in reaching out to the communities, doing awareness about wildlife conservation. This has uh, recorded a very big impact because as we're working together on ground, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, they will explain the impact of the 20%, which is the park entrance fees that goes back to the community to improve the infrastructures such as clinics, schools, among others, or improving the livelihood. Though we cannot reach everyone in the community and individually, the Queen Women Network comes in to support the livelihood activities, but aiming at saving the mountain gorillas as well as uh, other wildlife animals found in the Buindi Imperial National Park. Together, we promote conservation and community development by aiming at saving the mountain gorillas and other wildlife animals in the protected area. Mm -hmm. the, actually, this has been a very good collaborative between us and as well as the local government. Because when you're implementing the, such a project on the ground, you need total support of the government side and also the conservation organization side. So when we're moving as a team, we are able to achieve bigger than being uh, moving alone. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, so, so my next question is coming out of um, a previous research that our team in Basel has, has conducted in Uganda, where we have tried to understand why people would engage in illicit activities, including poaching, but also corruption in general. And in our research, we found that, of course, covering basic needs is an important factor, but it's not always the only one. Uh, and rather, we have heard that people often engage in illicit activities uh, out of a desire to attain a, an elevated social status or to earn admiration, and that otherwise a person that um, passes up opportunities to enrich him or, or herself might be shamed by their families or others uh, for not taking those opportunities. So I'm wondering how, how did does Windy Development Network take these considerations into account in the development of the Reformed Poachers Program? Um, thank you. The development of the Reformed Poachers Program, first of all, we empower them. How do we empower them? After reforming the reform poachers, we realize that they should be self-sustained. And on this, we encourage them to form their own association and as reform poachers. They have formed their own association and it is being registered with the local government as a community-based organization. That one enables them to have a bigger voice and develop themselves. With our support from Windy Development Network, established the first Windy Reform Poachers Center in Uganda, where they unite themselves. And at the same center, they offer traditional poaching experience to tourists, students at a cost. And the revenue generated from the experience goes directly to them to improve their livelihood. That one also contributes uh, to the sustainability of their reform poacher program. Uh, the reform poachers are also being encouraged to participate in both development and conservation activities through our community outreaches program. Okay, okay. So, so, so it's it's really about making 
the transition from a poacher to a reformed poacher, a, a, a part of the community life, a part of, um, of almost becoming like a new identity as a community member that is associated with the pride of, uh, of supporting conservation and supporting, in the end, supporting community revenue through the, um, the, the, the park ent entrance fees that come back to the community, correct? Yes, that's it. Thank you so much, Alex. This is really very interesting and I'm so happy to hear of a success story. And um, I, I hope that we will see you in the Q&A uh, session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too. Thank you for your time. And uh, I invite you to come to Uganda, we need in particular to uh... and we will of course see him uh, now in the next round and afterwards also for your questions. Uh, I think it's very interesting to hear about uh, this project, how you use a network of promoting peer social dynamics, leaders, no vectors of change and aligning this uh, actually sustaining no protecting the environment. Uh, but aligning it with the incentive of uh, sustaining the community and in developing this sense of pride also. So let's move to the second round, uh, which gives us the opportunity to dive a bit deeper into the, in generally speaking, the opportunities and the challenges of applying behavioral insights, because it's also true that, well, um, it's a relatively new approach, at least in practice. Uh, and uh, there are some questions still about uh, how to best apply it and uh, what can we learn from, from past experience. So perhaps Alex, let's start with you. Um, can you share your thoughts on the main challenges and opportunities you see in the implementation of the reform purchase program? And especially how far this can be scaled up and implemented in other parts in Uganda? Thank you, the moderator. I'm happy to be in this session. Uh, the, challenge, the challenges and opportunities we have had at Green Women Network. I'll start with the opportunities. Um, we have had an opportunity of the one, the poachers being realized that there is a general destruction caused by their activities. Um, to the park through killing of animals and uh, for their selfish interests. And they, they managed to accept to lay down their poaching tools. Um, the reform poachers are regrouped and uh, they formed an association. These are some of the opportunities. Um, we have the remarkable ventures in the history of Queen Imperial National Park, uh, where, poaching, where poachers have been, uh, uh, have done to save the, the life of the mountain gorillas, where actually they used to be victims of poaching uh, caused by, you know, sna uh, uh, snares, uh, traps, and uh, other killings. So now that they have reformed from poaching, they are actually protecting the mountain gorillas and other wildlife, which is actually a very good remark in, in history of Gwindi in Gwindi National Park. Um, the poachers are now carrying our uh, conser wildlife conservation awareness to, to their local communities and convincing any other person who might be still uh, practicing poaching and they encourage such a persons to lay down their tools and join them at their um, conservation demonstration center. Um, the, the reform poachers have uh, got an opportunity of being supported to improve their livelihoods. Uh, such as uh, agriculture uh, and saving culture. 
we have reached the local schools uh, aiming at engaging at the, the local schools in wildlife conservation, targeting to, to empower the younger generation in wildlife, in wildlife conservation leadership and bring a brighter future uh, to the, uh, for the wildlife. Those are some of the opportunities. Our challenges are uh, one, um, we are still facing a challenge of poaching. So we have managed to reform some, but others are still there, but hopefully they will all come out slowly, slowly. But this is due to global demand of uh, uh, illegal wild drive. So this global demand uh, contributes a lot uh, and enables the frontline community to keep watching. Higher priced and varied animal uh, uh, parts for products is also causes, uh, causes them to continue poaching. We have, there is a cultural uh, medicinal values, um, food for change of diet, and the challenge of poaching are uh, still happening mostly uh, in other national parks where we are not reaching as of today. So I hope in the future with expansion of this project to other national parks can solve the situation. I call upon everyone to participate in the conserving wildlife. Conservation, wildlife conservation needs action now. And uh, the coming generation will start from where we have stopped. Thank you very much, Alex. Indeed, I think the, the work you're doing in the schools is key also in, in, in promoting the change. Gail, um, so we hear that, I mean, be, behavioral insight is not a silver bullet. Um, you said it, and it may not always work. How can we better discern where are the opportunities and entry points uh, we can use to apply behavioral insights for curbing illicit trade? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Frederick. So um, a key, I, I guess, to this, anybody would say is, is understanding the context and, and um, conducting adequate insights so that you can map, you know, where you can make a change and where something more structural or more legislative or appropriate enforcement of laws is, is more uh, relevant and a, a higher priority. So, so some examples to think about include um, you know, dealing with bribes and if um, enforcement officials are actually using these as a substitute for poor income, you know, it's, it's, it's very well to kind of conduct um, social norm appeals and behaviour change campaigns that try to reduce public tolerance of that and, and try to put um, more pressure on um, uh, enforcement officials to um, you know, stop doing that, but it doesn't solve the overall problem. So I think in order to actually look at corruption as a, a, a complex or a, a wicked problem is another way to think about it. You need to understand all of these facets. Um, conversely, though, social and behaviour change can be a very important part of the mix. And at the moment, I think it's more the challenge that um, people aren't thinking about it at all. Um, so it's about how can we enable anti-corruption actors to mainstream this as, as one standard part of the overall set of strategies that they deploy to, to tackle these sorts of situations. And that can include in things like um, increasing uh, take up of codes of conduct or traceability systems, organizational strategies, as well as shifting social tolerance. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to actually encourage people to, to tackle corruption and not just feel it's something that's always been there, that it's such a pervasive issue, they won't be able to make a difference. Um, and to come up with creative strategies for doing that, there's, there's several examples that um, we could cite. So, so thinking about things like the zero rupee notes that um, they used in India to kind of use as a way to say, I'm not actually going to pay this bribe. Um, and um, other things like, uh, you know, designers in, I think it was Paraguay that designed the anti-corruption suit. You know, these are all very powerful communication tools as well as ways to 
um, to sort of think about um, practical solutions to tackling corruption. So I, th I think the key thing is really to, to consider how to do that in, in order to um, get some advice and insight. Um, you know, Traffic is uh, delighted to be working with Basel to um, kind of expand the pool of knowledge and come up with some practical case studies and ideas about how we can do this. So uh, keep in touch with us for more information in that regard. Um, Traffic has some additional material on our website. We have a behaviour change conservation toolkit and training course. As part of that, um, we also have um, what we call a behaviour change decision tree. So it's... Uh, sorry for the echo. Um, but um, yeah, if you if you go on to changewildlifeconsumers.org, you'll, you'll see from the drop down menu there, have a look for our behaviour change decision tree, um, and this will make a start. But um, very excited to be collaborating with Basel to, to build on that very significantly and, and give people the tools that they can um, use in order to identify where best to, uh, to bring in that behavioural and social norm solution. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. I think that's 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 exactly also my my feeling and uh, wh what I hear from from discussing with other colleagues. Uh, BI helps us to understand the problem, and even this inductive approach in itself is is already uh, a, a step into the right direction. And of course, there, there are always some broader and different different contexts that are making things more and more more difficult. And it's definitely a, a tool that brings us. To think about problems and thus also perhaps to come up with some innovative solutions. And, and I also agree that um, in practice much can be done more so we can still uh, uh, promote and, and, and communicate the values of this. Um, in turn in research actually a lot has been done and uh, since, since the early 2000s and uh, Saba this brings me a to you what what in your opinion are the most relevant themes that research could take up in order to advance the fight against corruption in illicit wildlife trade in particular okay yeah thank you frederick that's actually a very very important question um yeah i think i think there are a lot of things we we, we know we know that corruption can facilitate iwt uh, we know that natural resource management or conservation can be ne negatively affected by corruption. Uh, and we know that targeting behavior, social norms, attitudes is a very important component of fighting corruption nowadays. And this too then would apply to green corruption. But there are also interesting, a lot of things we are actually, our evidence base is quite scarce on. And I just would like to highlight uh, a few here. I think one where themes one thing that's very, would, in my opinion, would need more uh, research on is about understanding really more the, the dynamics of corruption and, and the actors that are involved. What do I mean with that is that we understand more precisely the key practices we're trying to target, the key corruption risks we're trying to address, and, um, and the behaviors we're trying to target. Without understanding that, we cannot really develop an approach to fight it. Uh, the second um, uh, field, I think, you know, that uh, is, is, is the idea, obviously, we understand that corrupt, theoretically speaking, corruption can facilitate many stages or many aspects of the entire chain or supply chain, the way you would like to frame it. But practically speaking, it would not be everywhere at the same level or even at the same time. Or So we need to understand where the biggest corruption risk lies to, to frame that corruption facilitates everything to make it bigger than that is, 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 is we need to have that more narrow and nuanced evidence where are the biggest corruption risk and target efforts efforts there another point is to just is, is to pick up on also what gail just mentioned that you know it, it would that corruption manifests itself its scope its prevalence depends on the context in which we are it would look different perhaps in, in uganda than another country on the continent and elsewhere obviously so when we understand the way it looks in a particular context we have a better approach of tackling it and the fourth one which i think in my perspective is really key is that we cannot over ascribe corruption to corruption as the major driver of iwt we need to understand that there might be other attributes that relate that are associated with the weak governance that would give us heightened corruption risk, but they are not always corruption. Let's think about a lack of resources or capacities to really monitor illicit trade or, or, or elsewhere. If we if 
we might be over ascribing corruption or we might be under understanding what are the other factors that are creating an environment in which illicit wildlife trade can flourish. So we have to give it its correct relative weight. I think this is a very important uh, um, uh, insight, particular for practitioners. So there, I, I believe there's really, an, there's an, there's really a, a big uh, yeah, need to have a better evidence base to understand where do the biggest corruption risks lie? What works in trying to tackle those? What doesn't? Um, rather than having a lot of, um, <laughs> you know, motion without movement. So we, that means we have to understand um, uh, the, 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 we have to also focus much more on monitoring and evaluation. So what kind of approach? What are the indicators of success? What would a success, effective approach to fight corruption look like? What are the indicators of success? And how would we measure that impact? That would give us the stepping stones to better understand how to an evidence base to better fight uh, uh, the green corruption, also the behavioral drivers that are associated with it, with it. And that would really also bridge the gap or much more closely between corruption specialists and, and conservation as a natural resource management specialist. Thank you. Uh, it reminds me really, I mean, context matters. It's, it's a very old insight, but I think that behavioral insights takes it really serious um, because you, you cannot really uh, address, uh, take the behavioral lens without understanding the context, unpacking corruption. As you say, there are many corrupt practices. And sometimes when we say corruption, it's so broad that it really doesn't reflect the, the variety of, of practices. And also the, the issue of measuring uh, this, um, it, it's actually, um, well, worrying that we have actually very little hard evidence of what works and why, and BI also helps us in, 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 in being more serious about measurement. I have a, I have a question from the audience um, for Saba. Uh, I will, I hope I, I reflected correctly. Uh, so basically, so, Resource sharing schemes from parks and protected areas impact on wildlife traffic. But uh, how could behavioral approach help achieve harmony between these tensions, let's say, of the economic drivers, uh, of the people uh, who work in the area, and um, and uh, and the, the yeah and, and fighting against uh, this traffic? And perhaps Alex, you want to jump in also after afterwards. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, yeah, I think it's a very, very important point. Um, I think I can approach it in different ways. Um, um, I think when we, when I think this is also the case in Uganda. So I think it's really good if Alex can also follow up. If you have a, a scheme which, which uh, typically uh, you there would there is a, a wildlife habitat and there's a percentage of those research are supposed to go to the communities and it doesn't happen maybe for different reasons or corruption. So there are different, um, if we think for instance, what I mentioned just now about um, making this, uh, exposing the hidden costs of that, one way would be to think about what, what are the, uh, to make it more salient really for, for communities around there, what is, what is the hidden cost of them not missing, not getting these kind of um, resources, what could have been, done with these resources that would have um, improved the, their environment rather than perhaps as um, using that as a justification to engage in trafficking because th there's not really these the wildlife do not benefit us and all those other different things I was speaking about. So one way it could be about uh, um, illuminating the hidden cost, but it could also be about very different. There's a, there's a study about um, uh, in the area of this was education done where actually just uh, making it much more public the kind of um, resources that are available at this level would also create uh, give people much more um, uh, understanding in what they're missing out so this can also be about information which is uh, and then the way that is communicated so there there might be different ways um, to tackle this one but I'd like to give Alex also a chance because I think this is really something that's also part and parcel of his, his project. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's not easy to tackle that one, as uh, you've said, Saba. Uh, but uh, the most uh, important is to reach the very community and doing uh, education. And uh, that one brings out the basic information that could help and uh, tackle other uh, challenges that are happening. Thank you. There are actually also two, two more questions uh, from the audience for, for Alex, so I, I just uh, follow up on this. Uh, one question is, um, you, you have mentioned that there are about 250 reform vouchers, uh, but what is your estimate about the general amount of vouchers in Uganda? Um, and also, it would be interesting to learn if you have been in touch uh, with other countries with similar programs, uh, uh, in, or in Uganda or outside Uganda? Um, thank you. Uh, this project started in Buindi Imperial National Park, and uh, it has not been uh, expanded to other national parks in Uganda yet. So that's uh, in my presentation, that's why I mentioned that uh, uh, now that we have tested this model, it can work in Buindi. Hopefully, it can also work in other national parks that are, affect, are being affected by illegal wildlife activities in Uganda and even outside Uganda, perhaps. Thank you very much. Uh, then I have a question that I would say is for Gail. Um, could you expand perhaps a bit more on the tools, on the toolbox we can use? In, behavioral in applying behavioral insights, uh, especially perhaps this famous uh, nudging. Um, and uh, also perhaps, and this is a question I would add, uh, nudges have been also criticized for being perhaps not sustainable over time. Um, so please tell us a bit more about the tools and, and perhaps also some of the lessons you learned. Sure. Um, so it's it's an interesting question. I guess um, you know I, I would I would always uh, start from the principle that you need to think about uh, people's internal motivations and the benefits and the barriers that they have to uptake of the desired behaviour. So that relates a lot to what the other speakers have already reinforced about understanding the motivations and and the practical restrictions they may have to engage in a positive choice, a more positive choice. So there's something about that. Um, Nudges, I always see those as part of one part of the larger picture. I, I think uh, a nudge is a way to um, deal with the fact that a lot of people use what's called heuristics and biases. They shortcut mental decision making. Um, for those that have read Kahneman, it relates to system one and two thinking. Probably don't need to get into too much of the detail on that today, but it, it's just, I guess, from all of our experience, uh, we understand that in order to um, save time, save cognitive effort, you just go into some defaults and, and that's what nudges really tackle. I think where it's a bit more um, deliberative decision making, where it's a bit more um, you're planning this in advance, you're actually thinking about engaging in a corrupt act or not, that's where you require a, a, a different approach and one that really looks at that mix of kind of uh, social normative pressure, uh, trying to make sure that um, the structural interventions that could help push people to more towards a positive choice are in place. Things like, um, I always go back to the one where inadequate salaries are, you know, bribes are used as a, a substitute for adequate salaries. Those are real issues that um, can't be addressed through nudges or behaviour change interventions, but also need to be a realistic part of, of any picture. So um, I think it's, uh, it goes back for me again to doing that proper context analysis, understanding exactly where you can intervene from a behaviour change perspective, and then thinking about, well, is it something that a nudge could maybe fix, or is it actually something that is more about campaigns, more about social normative pressure, getting people to um, understand and enact traceability systems. Um, those, those kind of decisions need to be made uh, quite early on as part of the, the programme design. So I, um, we have some information, as I say, on our website. I, I shared the links in the uh, answered Q&As um, 
so hopefully people can see those but as i say um you know we're, we're really looking forward to to working with basel to to build up this picture a lot more i know um u4 and oecd also have uh, a range of material on their own sites um so uh, i've included the links to those as well in uh, an effort to be as inclusive as possible but um thanks thank you very much i i actually have a, a very quick question to to all the three of uh, you um I mean, traditionally, anti-corruption focuses strongly on detection and sanctioning. And uh, we have evidence from uh, behavior insights research that shows that too heavy controls and too high sanctions actually can drive out uh, intrinsic motivation of behaving ethically. Have you came across uh, this aspect in your uh, work? Uh, what do you think? Perhaps uh, Saba first, I see you nodding. <laughs> I was not nodding because it was a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's 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 very interesting point. Um, the, the 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 one thing that my where my mind takes me is that actually that that there is a lot of research or evidence also to say that if you uh, that that when people are voluntarily committed to conservation, for instance, that they are, that there is that builds actually the motivation for it, rather than, for instance, paying someone to engage in conservation or all these aspects. Um, and, and also think more in general, if you do not target the driver of the corruption, you can do a lot of controlling, but people find a way around that. That's like that whack-a-mole system. Um, so it's to me, it's not only about the internal motive, it wouldn't address the internal motivation. It's just about the difference in risk. Uh, and I think when you look at it from a behavioral angle, it's it, it's not only a risk assessment, there's also a taking into account the social at, uh, aspects of that decision-making. So it doesn't take away uh, that, that, pro uh, that process. It might actually put a person at more a constrained environment because maybe his whole environment or network tells them, well, please extract resources for us and his, in his, but public bureaucratic environment has tight, tightened the nudges on this person. They are still between a rock and a hard place. Um, so um, we need to understand where, when it is about, uh, when it's a, let's call it, when it's about increased monitoring is important and that's, for, that's the cause of the corruption, or it's actually about a social driver that's related to the behavior. So the assumption that monitoring helps has to do with the underlying idea that that's the that we are not engaging in the right behavior because we're not monitored but that's an assumption but uh yeah yeah ex excellent again about balancing no uh, alex gail do you want to add something gail? i don't know um alex do go ahead if you if you if you have anything to say here Yeah, um, I would say that uh, overcoming wildlife illegal activities is a, needs a combined effort. Uh, a single head or a single organization may not tackle all the challenges. So we need to be together to look what, cause, what causes illegal wildlife uh, activities, how can we overcome those challenges, and we look at the right and uh, the right intervention to wherever the project is being implemented. But I would still recommend that uh, doing the research in whatever area the project will be recommend, uh, implemented is much better because to drive you to wherever you are heading. So I call upon for a combined effort in order to, uh, to save the world life animals. I think uh, Frederick, I would only add to that. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about how, um, you know, a techno technological innovation um, uh, 
that's not quite a drone, but thinking about CCTV and, and the prominence of that in some European cities, for example, uh, and the extent to which that could be used to track littering and prosecute and fine people. I mean, it, it, there are really very different tolerances of this in different societies. And um, I, I'm sure we can all appreciate there's great uh, you know, merit uh, in using technologies such as this, but I would be careful about the rebound of, you know, does that erode actually goodwill uh, around which people can actually want to make a change. And there's something called um, reactance theory and behavior change that's quite well known with, with smokers. You take something away from them and they redouble their desire to have a cigarette. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you just need to sort of, uh, I, I guess, make sure that if you're, you are using that intervention, don't rely on that only. I think that's absolutely critical. I, I see that it should be used as part of a bigger picture, but then also think very carefully about whether if you do use it, it may undermine the wider opportunity, which is about goodwill for social change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's actually also one, I think, one of the interesting outcomes of applying behavioral insights that sometimes it sheds lights on some unintended consequences that we may have not been aware of when we well intentionally, hopefully, uh, design the policies. Uh, for instance, campaigns, no? traditional anti-corruption campaigns that say there's a lot of corruption can actually you know, uh, stabilize this, uh, this uh, perception of everybody's corrupt. And we heard that this can have some unintended consequences. So it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you again to all three of you for your interventions and your insights and sharing your, your lessons and experiences. So in a nutshell, behavioral insights can contribute to significantly improve our understanding of why people engage or participate in unethical illicit behaviors. And in turn, it helps us in understanding and, and fine tuning and better designing our policy responses. Because in the end, changes happens when people start behaving differently. And, and this is really where impact uh, happens. So thank you.